The Boston Celtics keep on marching closer to the top of the East. So where does Jason Tatum sit in the MVP conversation? Can he be MVP? What would it take for him to be MVP? We're going to talk about that. And Peyton Pritchard on a certified heater. We'll dig into those numbers too right now on the Locked On Celtics podcast. Be ever ready. Recognize the city of champs. Boston, baby, we do what you can't. Locked on number 18, Tatum and Brown, J team, step back. We gon' wet that and slay teams. Of course, the Celtics, who else could it be? Screaming like KG with the Larry OB. Corral is above average, assessing the team status. Best daily pod, no cap, salary matching. Clutch like Bird to DJ, keep John on replay. Primetime, dapping up the truth on the sideline. Rain and Jays, how it started, raising banners, how we finished. Locked on Celtics pod, home of the winners. B. Welcome back to the Locked On Celtics podcast. Thank you for making this show part of your daily routine, Monday through Friday. Please make this your first listen. I know many of you do, so thank you for making it your first listen every day. Uh, available everywhere podcasts exist. YouTube, watch the show on YouTube. And uh, yeah, subscribe, share it, everything, all that stuff. I'm John Corrales. I cover the Celtics for Boston Sports Journal. I've written a book called the Boston Celtics All-Time All-Stars. I have it somewhere here. It is. Boston says Celtics All-Time All-Stars. A couple people bought the book. Off my website, I sign it for 30 bucks and uh, mail it out to you. Internationally, uh, is an extra charge. If you are somewhere internationally, I'm sorry. It's not my my choice. It's the U.S. Postal Service's choice. Uh, let's talk a little uh, basketball here with uh, Tom Westerholm. Tom underscore NBA on the tweets. Boston.com with the words. Tom, how you feeling, man? I was catching, man. That was, uh, that was good. I'm good, man. How are you? It's Friday, man. It's casual Friday. Professionalism gets dialed back about 30% on the Friday show. Oh boy. That's that, that <laughs> dialing well, back. A negative number for you. 30%. Be a negative number for you. Yeah. It's dialing it back pretty far. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> I'm up here. You got to bring it down. Like here. I got like my creature double feature shirt on. Like just, just take a little, didn't even, I didn't even brush out my beard. I need a little. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, man. I'm I'm wearing I'm wearing sweatpants. I oh I got, yeah. I got a workout in. I I haven't showered. We're we're rolling. Oh, I'm stuff. fresh off the treadmill, man. I'm I Love had it. treadmill. I had half a salad before I sat down. And I'm like, oh crap, we got to record a podcast. So let's go. Let's talk basketball so we can get this sucker out there, man. Um, we'll talk uh, Peyton Pritchard, I guess, later on in the third segment. Let's spend the first couple of segments on the game, the Jazz game, and Jason Tatum. It's funny, just to let people in on a little bit of the background here. Uh, Tom, the other day when we were recording, said, you know what? I got this. Let, what if we talked about Jason Tatum as MVP? I said, ooh, okay. Let's let's save that. Let's save that for the Thursday show. We'll let that marinate over the weekend. Jason Tatum, MVP discussion. Then then he just keeps going out and he, you dropping 20, 26 points on, was it 16 shots or 15 shots? Like, high efficiency where each time he plays a game, it's like, um, yeah, yeah. I can see, I can see him creeping into the conversation. It's like less spicy than we thought just even a couple of days ago. It's funny because I I, I do the the person specifically that I wanted to shout out was because you and I talked about it. And then literally that evening I saw Coley Mick, um, just like, it, like tweeting about like, ah, oh, Tatum's the MVP for sure. And I was like, come on. Come on. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's funny. I, I think it's, it's spicy. If you, if you really hammer in on like Jason Tatum should be the MVP, that would still be spicy. I think if because you really argued for him to be number one. Then yeah. Yes. Then yeah. Because you know, Jokic and, and Embiid have had great seasons and their teams are, you know, doing, you know, perfectly acceptably to be in the, you know, to be in that conversation, Giannis Antetokounmpo is still Giannis Antetokounmpo, all these things. I do think that the case for Tatum is, like, if, you, if you're just making it, there is a case to be made for Jason Tatum. That's not spicy at all. That's just, like, look, this team has a real chance to end up the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, and you pretty much go down the board. They're, they like, they rise and fall with Jason Tatum, especially right now, especially, yeah. like, offensively. I mean, he... And, and, you know, you go through the film, it is just, it, I mean, almost every play that he is in the game, even if he doesn't touch the ball, it's just built on the fact that teams are terrified of Jason Tatum. Yep. Teams are freaking out whenever he touches the ball, when, whenever he runs a pick and roll, 
the Celtics automatically have an advantage. And that's MVP stuff. You know, that is the reason that Nikola Jokic can win MVPs is because teams freak out when he has the ball. He still gets his buckets. He still gets his assists. He still contributes in the in massive way that he does. Tatum does the same thing now. So if the Celtics end up being the number one seed or if they're that number two seed range, look, I mean, it's the, the case is there. Like you, you can vote for it or not vote for it. You can take into account all the stuff that happened at the beginning of the season if you want. I would argue there's almost a better case for Tatum MVP based on that because of the fact that the Celtics struggled so much. Now that he's playing so well, they're almost the number one seed. Like, I don't know, man. He's he's been awesome, and uh, I think the case to make to the case to be made is pretty easy. Yeah, look, this is this is going to be such an interesting discussion because the really what we're talking about and the argument against him is when they lost their games, right? It's that's kind of all it is because Milwaukee is forty five and twenty seven, Boston is forty six and twenty eight, Philly is forty five and twenty seven, right, and Denver is forty three and thirty. They're all in the same mix, right? Yeah. Boston has um, a top I, – I don't know where they rank overall for the season offensively in uh, in, in uh, offensive rating, but it's – the- I checked, they were, about, they were about 10th. Okay. So they are, they're about a top 10 team offensively, and certainly since the All-Star break, they're number one. But over the course of the season, just forget that. Over the course of the season, they've got a, an offense that's that's decent. They've got uh, the number one defense. They've got um, all of the things when you were to, if you were to ask all of the big name voters, you listen to those big podcasts like the Kevin Arnovitzes and Zach Lowe and all of the big voters, when they lay out their case, what makes an MVP? Boston, just in general, you say, okay, yeah, that everything that you have, Tatum leads the league in scoring total points. No one has scored more points than Jason Tatum in the NBA this year. Um, He's gotten better. His team's gotten better. But because the Celtics front-loaded all of their losses, that created this, this kind of perception that, well, Celtics aren't good. And we can't, we just can't consider a guy from the Celtics because they're, they're not good. And now the uh, Grandy had the best, the best uh, little thing there was, was 23 and 24 was the Celtics record there. And then since then it's been 23 and just four, but yeah. in that time, uh, okay. Tatum's become arguably, if, if you were just to go from, January 1st, MVP Tatum's in the middle of that conversation. So the argument, honestly, if people are if people are dismissing Tatum as a legitimate MVP candidate, it's because the losses all came in November and December, and back then he wasn't playing well. And now he just happens to be crossing over and playing better. And Jokic and Embiid and those guys have just been doing it for longer. It doesn't matter that Tatum caught up it's that they've just been leading the race for longer. And here's, okay, so here's the case against it, right? So the, the argument against it to me, it's Tatum hasn't technically caught up. Like if, even if you just go by pure counting stats, right? Which like, like that's, if I was, if I had an MVP vote, I don't. But if I, if I had an MVP vote, it certainly would not be based on counting stats exclusively. But if you just go on that, Joel Embiid for the season is averaging 29.8 points per game and 11.3 rebounds. Nikola Jokic is averaging 26.2 points, 13.6 rebounds, 8.0 assists. Like Tatum is not quite in that stratosphere. Now, if you look at the last 20 games, Tatum is in that stratosphere. Like mm-hmm. he's the last 20 games, he's averaging 29 points. I'm not sure what that averages out to when you go back to when the Celtics got good. But I, I think the point that I guess I would make is that Tatum hasn't caught up for the season and the first half does matter. However, the second half is where the Celtics established themselves as a potential number one team in the Eastern Conference. And that is when Tatum has been the MVP candidate. So, like, again, you know, this kind of comes down to the semantics that you always argue about every single year with MVP, where it's like valuable versus best player of the year, whatever it is. But if, you know, in terms of value, Jason Tatum becoming the MVP candidate, putting up MVP numbers 
has turned the Celtics into a team that can compete for the number one seed. So to, to me, that's the argument because like for the whole season, he has not caught Embiid and he has not caught Jokic. And, 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 and that I, if you make that case to me, like, okay, it, it really is for the whole season. I'm willing to hear that. I'm willing to accept that. I might even buy into that, but I mean, you know, the truth is that like Tatum's value to the Celtics has never been more evident um, than it has over the last, you know, two months or whatever it is. And uh, his numbers match the other MVP candidates over that stretch. Here's and, and look, I, I'm I'm kind of I, I'm I if I were a voter, I, I actually I wouldn't be voting for Jason Tatum for MVP right now. I don't think I would either. Yeah, <laughs> so like, like this, but but I, I'm I'm willing to make the argument. Like I think it's it's worth kind of fighting for that just to kind of just to put it out there. Yeah. So Tatum, he, here's here's the counter to all of this, where and it's it's the argument that disqualified Embiid last year, and kind of pushed it towards Jokic Tatum's played 70 games and he's played 36 minutes a game and he's he's still averaging the 27 points um the how many rebounds is he averaging uh like seven point something 7.4 maybe 8.1 oh wow. 8.1 and 4.3 wow. assists so yeah he's he's the assist numbers aren't high enough necessarily I think that that's kind of where um like if you're going to consider uh, where's Jokic in here, he's got eight. Yeah. So that like Jokic, Jokic, I think is, is probably the MVP. He, and he's played 66 games. So he's the one that's closest and beads played 59. Uh, Giannis has played 60, but it's, it's Tatum in there playing this whole thing, um, playing all of these minutes and still not just putting up numbers, but getting better as things go along. There, I, I do think that there's a case. Should he be the MVP? Mm. Eh. Hard time, hard time for me to 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 earnestly say yes. I'm going to say that he's the MVP. Let's let's get into that more in that uh, on that in a minute. I know I can see you like, but I'll let you I'll let you make your reply in just a moment. First, uh, let's talk about Bet Online, which is the place to go for all of your latest odds, contests, player props. Uh, you're going to throw a few bucks down. I hope you didn't bet on Gonzaga. Last I checked, they were losing. Um, and, and I'm looking at Providence. Like last I saw, they were seven and a half point underdogs. Still not still not ready to pull the trigger on that one, but uh, hoping that they can pull the upset on Kansas. Obviously, March Madness, the NCAA tournament, is where a lot of people are going to be throwing some money down. And you better be doing it at Bet Online because it is the best spot for all of this stuff. Scores podcast news as well as that. And if you're not into basketball betting, you can go into baseball, MMA, hockey, all kinds of stuff over there. So check it out. Head on over to BetOnline.net and uh, check it out on the website or your mobile device. Check out the trends, all the latest action. Bet Online is where the game starts. Please gamble responsibly. And I just told you about Bet Online. How about listening to the Locked On Bets podcast? Lee Sterling, your boy Q, they're going to guide you through the uh, the betting world, some of their uh, best bets, some of their locks. Wrong team favorite is a nice little segment that they, that they do. Uh, if you're going to be throwing some money down, you might as well get some good guidance. And I think Locked On Bets is probably the best guidance that you're going to get. So listen to Locked On Bets wherever you get your podcast and uh, check it out. Because why not get a little helping hand? All right, Tom Westerholm. You, you had something to say as I was laying out the Tatum has played more than everybody. Um, and I think that that could be something in his favor. So you, I, I, I cut you off. Hey man, bills have to be paid. I respect it. Um, <laughs> look, I, so, I mean, the, the point that you were making that I was curious about was, you know, you and I both said we probably would not vote for Tatum if we had votes or we definitely would not vote for Tatum if we had votes. I'm curious. So does that change for you, though, if the Celtics do end up being the number one seed? Because for um, me, that's when I start having to take it really seriously. It is it is interesting. to. I, I think that's where you really have to start considering these awards because the number one seed, it, this is such a weird season because usually the number one seed has been the number one seed for a while. And the fact that the Celtics – are um, are coming along like after the fact is it's not it's not typical. 
So I, I kind of argue with myself here, but when you get, when you get to that top seed, how do you not reward the top seed with, with something? Right. And so, that, yeah. but that's why Monty Williams is going to end up getting part of why the Monty Williams is going to start getting coach of the year. What, what do the Celtics get yeah. in, in all of this? If, if they're not going to get one of these MVP defensive player of the year, coach of the year, six man of the, and they don't have, they have so far people in the discussion. And that's as, as far as people I think are willing to go. They've got uh, Tatum in the discussion, Ime in the discussion, Smart in the discussion, but no one's willing to kind of go that far. But the Celtics just keep on winning. Like we, the Jazz were supposed to be this. Like, all right, let's let's see how they do. Even I was saying it. Even I was saying it. Let's see how they do against the shot blocker because shot blockers have typically given them problems. Um, and Rudy Gobert didn't block a damn shot. So they and the they Celtics had, started like ten for ten from the field. So yeah, I mean they didn't. They had no answers for that guy. Yeah. So uh, it was like okay. I think I think what's what's happening here is we're running out of the collective we we're running out of things to kind of hold against the Celtics and Philly Philly doesn't want the top seed Philly wants the third seed or the fourth seed right. but like like a, there's now this clamoring to get down to third or fourth probably fourth because people are dying to to, to face Chicago Bulls in the first round and and you know Miami if Miami holds on. People were like, yeah, sure, give us Miami. Yeah, um, it, it would be wild to me, though, just as an aside, if like Philly engineers their way down to fourth and Boston steals that top seed and they go, oh, man, <laughs> damn it. That would be very <laughs> funny. That would be very funny because then Philly would end up facing a team that has just haunted them as opposed to the team where the head coach and the star player are going to come to fisticuffs in the next couple of weeks here. So, <laughs> um, yeah. But- but yeah, I, I think we're the, people are just running out of excuses. If the Celtics get that top seed, you have to change the calculus. Like the equation just changes. So uh, I, I kind of ask that as like a devil's advocate thing because I, I do think I think the other team that this applies to is you mentioned Monty Williams. Like the other team that this applies to is the Suns because the Suns are not probably they might have like a couple of like lower tier All NBA guys. They have nobody in the MVP discussion. Frankly, I mean, they have Mikal Bridges, who I assume is in like you know all defense first team discussions, but he's not in like even he's not even in in the um, I, I don't even think he's in the defensive player of the year discussion the way that Marcus Smart is at this point after like you know everybody's been caping for him for so long. I I think that is a big part of it, right? Is that it, Tatum? You you can make an MVP case for Tatum in the same way that you can make an, a DPOY case for Marcus Smart in the same way you can make. Um, you know, the, these, the, the coach of the year case for Ime Udoka, it's, it's not unreasonable. The Celtics are great, but I think the fact that you can make a coach of the year case and a defensive player of the year case and an MVP case, it does kind of take away a little bit the, uh, kind of the, the juice from the, the Celtics are the number one seed. So Tatum should be the MVP. Well, the Celtics are the number one seed, partly because Tatum is, is putting up MVP numbers, but also because. Marcus Smart could be in the defensive player of the year conversation, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I, I, again, there are plenty of arguments against Tatum being the MVP that I'm willing to listen to. I, I wouldn't vote for him right now. I'm, you can make good cases against it. But I think ignoring it is ignoring, like, a guy who is putting up almost 30 points a game over this stretch, who is the, the, the primary focal point for the Celtics offensively. Like, everything runs through him. This this offense that's been so good is is good because of him. Like, like at, at very least to me that that's more than an All NBA third team guy to uh to, to counter one uh, right on an NBA podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let me ask you this question. We'll wrap it up with this. What does have to happen for Tatum to make a serious serious move for MVP? I, I think he needs to do this for an extended period next season. I, I, I don't think. No, I mean this cool. season. I mean this I know season. You do. I know you do. I, I'm saying I don't think it can be done this year. I, I'm I'm making the case because I think that, like, the conversation is worth having. But, like, I, I don't – I think that the, the early season narrative combined with the 
eight assists per game for Jokic and the 14 rebounds or whatever it is a game for Embiid. I, I, I think like those those types of things um, are. I, I, I kind of just don't think Tatum can get there. But I, I mean, he, he could for 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 me to vote for him. Look, I think the Celtics would need to be the number one seed, and I think you know get his numbers up, you know, to 30, 31 per game over his last 20 games, right? Like that to me, like, you know, if, if he leads the Celtics to that number one seed and he's just putting up these gaudy, undeniable MVP stats, look, I mean, yep. he's a great defender. He's, you know, he's, he's doing defender, literally yep. everything. Maybe even like, you know, if he's putting up like 30 and his, and his, you know, five assists, you know, something where it's just like this dude put the Celtics on his back and just dragged them to the number one seed like that. That's pretty impressive. And here, that's not out of the question. Here, here's what I think. Philly, in their mad dash to uh, drop to fourth, sits Embiid. Sure. Okay? Yep. Sits Embiid, and and he he starts missing more games. And they drop. That's part one. Part two, Boston climbs and gets that number one seed. They beat Miami. They beat Milwaukee. They just continue this role, right? They, they, you know, they got to lose sometime, but like, it's, it's like, just like, like prove the, it. I, I, you can't prove they will. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe they won't. Maybe they don't have to, uh, but it would be, it would be something like the Dallas game where it's like, it, it, it takes a last second shot to beat them. Okay. So they, they finished number one. That's part two. I think for Denver, I think they would have to start slipping. And even though Jokic, Jokic is the guy, like Jokic is the one that you have to worry about. But I'm, I'm talking about like the conversation has been Jokic can beat all season long. And then if Embiid slips past Tatum, Milwaukee would have to slip a little bit because I think Giannis is kind of waiting in the wings. Yes, to, 100%. People, 100%. If people, people say, all right, I'm, I'm done with Embiid. And eh, Jokic, the, the ending has been kind of soft. Well, Giannis is right there, and Milwaukee's right there. And oh, by the way, he's having a, a, a Giannis season, and, and why not? Like he's he's obviously a very good defender, and he's he's dropping oh just under thirty points, six assists, and eleven and a half rebounds. Makes perfect sense. It would have to be the Celtics beating Milwaukee, the Celtics somehow claiming first place, and like winning it by a couple of games, like just this march to the top. And sure. then people would have to say, hey, you know what? Let's be real here. Two reasons. Two reasons why this happened. One, Ime Odoka and his defense, and he challenged Jason Tatum to become a more complete player who made his teammates better. And then Jason Tatum finally bought in. It took, it took like a couple of months, but we've seen MVPs have slow starts before couple months he buys in and then all of a sudden catches fire. And now he's making all of his teammates better. His assists are up. Everything's up. His efficiency's up. That that then at least starts him in that maybe it's not we're talking like fourth or fifth place. Now we're talking about third place. Is he going to challenge for second place? Right. And if he's in that conversation, then he could be in the other conversation. So I, I don't know. I, I still don't think – it's going to happen because Jokic is the guy and you still have Giannis that no one seems to be talking about. And Giannis is waiting right there, but Tatum, I, I would put Tatum over. I would put Tatum over in bead right now, but that's because of my own personal, I was going to say, I'm stunned, stunned to hear that. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the last thing I would say too, is that I think, I think Celtics fans, like they've been awesome. Like they've been the story of the NBA over this, over the stretch. I do think there is like a tendency to get a little greedy where it's like, well, the defense is the best defense in the league. Why is the smart DPOY? Well, the Celtics have been the best team in the, in the league for however many, uh, you know, forever long. Why isn't Tatum in the MVP discussion? If I were to give Celtics fans advice, I would really zero in on the one thing that you think is winnable. Like, is there a case to be made for Tatum MVP? Probably, but is he going to win it? No. He like, he, he's, no, he probably not. He's not going to win. He won't. So, um, could Marcus Smart just... win Defensive Player of the Year? Hmm? Yep, yep, maybe. It's just <laughs> interesting enough that voters could would may would, might consider it because you have to like some of this is narrative based. So I um I, I don't think I don't think campaigning is uh, 
a useless exercise here is what I'm saying. So uh, if, I, if you are a person who cares about these things, I would focus your energy wisely, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's look, this is, this is the beauty of rooting for a good team is you start to get like people talk about like, Oh, Celtics fans are insufferable. Every fan of a good team is insufferable mm -hmm. because fans live vicariously through the good team. And you feel like you can talk shit. Like you're exactly. the one who just dropped 30 points on six shots or something like that. Like that's, that's the joy of being a fan. So um, I get it. You're right. I, I think that, the Tatum MVP discussion is a fun one to have, and he's certainly kind of like kicking down the door. And and I still would put him like third in the MVP race right now, and I don't think he's going to climb up any further than that. But yeah. there's still like a little sliver. Like that door is still – like there's still room for him to kind of move up. Ime Odoka for Coach of the Year, certainly a valid conversation, much in the same way as Tatum, but that seems to be a foregone conclusion as well. There – that that defensive player of the year, you're right. That that could be the one. That's because the one. If the, I think that's the one finish first, yep. And everybody's like, damn, you got to give Boston something. And if you don't feel great about Rudy Gobert, because he's gotten it already, and you look at him and like, yeah, it's. I mean, that's is that the cop out one? He's still like, I mean, I, I, we just came off a game against the Jazz, and I, I hear David Locke saying, you know, Rudy Gobert is the best defender on the planet. Like, well, you know, that didn't work out so well for them in this game. But you still you still have the if you have the number one defense and the number one team, maybe you get more than the well, you get a couple of guys on the all defense team. Like the number one team has to get something. <laughs> That's always how it's been. So what do they get? What do you get? There's no six man candidate. There's, we've gone through the other ones. There's no most improved. I don't think you're going to get like Rob could Rob would, or Grant Williams. You can make a case. You can make a pretty can, good case. You can make Rob. cases, <laughs> but like you're not, you're not going to get the number. He doesn't have the numbers necessarily. Yeah. So like we can say like Grant Williams, I can't imagine he's not going to get it. Right. Like yeah. I'm saying this knowing that he's not going to get it, but I have a hard time believing that anybody has improved their game more than Grant Williams. Like he's really one of the most improved players in the league. He just doesn't have like the gaudy. He doesn't, he didn't go from five points to 19 or something like well, that. Well, but no, but he did go to one of the best corner three point shooters in the NBA. Like there is, sure. there is some gaudy there. <laughs> oh yeah. No, look, there's there, you know, he's in the like, Hey, you know, don't forget about Grant Williams. Yeah, exactly. You know, part of the conversation. Exactly. And, and, you know, Rob has a, a part of the, that, you know, a stake there too. Um, people will argue that, that Rob is based on getting like a ton more minutes probably because, but whatever, that's another thing. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Maybe we spend some time next, next week with, uh, Marcus Smart as defensive player of the year. We just really drill down on Marcus Smart defensive player of the year. Um, I just love the fact that we're having this conversation because it's, this is the conversation that you have when this team just keeps on winning and it's 10 and one in March and is now a game and a half out of first place. Yep. So, yep. Um, and looks like Milwaukee, as we record this, is going to beat the Washington Wizards. Wizards shocker. Um, so, Wizards stink. The Wizards are bad. Um, let's put that out there on record that the Boston Celtics finished the season slightly better than the Washington Wizards. Oh, it tastes good, man. That's a good one. I just, just for you, Thanks, just for man. you, because yeah. for just to let people on the inside joke, Chris Grenham. When uh, when you guys were doing the Geno Time podcast, you were talking about how he thought the Wizards and Celtics. He and Nicole, both he of and them. Nicole, he and Nicole both said the Wizards were a better team than the Celtics, and then spent the first month of the season really crowing about that, like really just like soaking that in. Uh, now look, he's got he's got his moments here. He's he, Sadiq Bay had his Ooh, like yeah, Sadiq's a good one for him. You know that's a good <laughs> Peyton one. Pritchard, Peyton he's, Pritchard is a good one for him. Yep, yep, and and. You know, Providence College, he's a Providence Ooh. College guy. So Ooh. he's flying high. Got to knock him down a peg. Just got to knock him down a peg. Gotta. Remind him. Got it. His abs are too nice. You got it. You got to knock him yeah, down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like he's, I'm not really jealous of people like that, but, you know, that dude is like 
too perfect because he's like he's a night he's like a good a good dude but like he's as good as they get yep. he's like the a really good guy he really knows his stuff he's he's excellent at analyzing basketball and like he's got like four percent body fat and he's just a, a an attractive person and i, I just can't accept that you can't you I can't like be the washington at- wizards way too much and they stink there you go knock him down a peg <laughs> send this one out tag grin him on this <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, you mentioned Peyton Pritchard. Let's get into Peyton Pritchard in just a moment. First, let's talk about NBA Top Shot, which is sponsoring this here podcast. NBA Top Shot, the officially licensed NFT of the NBA, connect with a community of hundreds of thousands of NBA fans as a natural progression of fantasy sports, a way to upgrade your experience as an NBA fan. This is different. Not everybody is kind of getting uh, what Top Shot is. It's kind of a combination of trading cards, stock market, fantasy sports, and sort of like an airline loyalty program. So it's digital collectibles. And, you know, once upon a time, people probably scoffed at putting a baseball player's picture on a piece of cardboard and and saying this has value. Well, here we are. It's 2022, and this is the new thing. Trading, it's a a digital trading card with blockchain technology and, and, you kind of open up a digital pack and and you can own these moments and people sell these moments just like people will sell their trading cards and people will trade them and all of that stuff and so uh i would say go check it out you know uh you can go sign up for top shot today and the best way to start is getting yourself a starter pack you can pull an nft of a superstar like lebron or kd or jason tatum star rookies like Cade cunningham evan mobley you can do it all for nine dollars and if you don't pull your favorite player from the starter pack, you can snag moments from the marketplace that appeal to you. Somebody found out that uh, Top Shot was sponsoring the podcast. They want to know my username, which is John Corrales. It's just my name. And you can send each other moments and all of that stuff. There are challenges. So those are a great way to earn exclusive moment F- NFT awards. You can complete challenges to unlock exclusive moment NFTs. So you can treat Top Shot like the best of daily sports. NBA Top Shot is the future of being an NBA fan. So you can own officially licensed rare NFTs of the greatest moments in NBA history. Sign up today, lockedon.nbatopshot.com. That's lockedon.nbatopshot.com. Today's show also brought to you by Built Bar. I just placed a new order for Built Bar. Got myself the salted caramel and double chocolate. And the best part about that is double chocolate's 130 calories. So I know I'm gonna grab a bar uh, when I when I go back to the gym, I want to run. I get my running in. And I get my lifting in, and 130 calories. I know that's I'm, I'm burning more calories than I'm taking in. Plus, I'm getting about 17 grams of protein. That's going to help me when I lift because you want to feed your muscles right after you, you lift. But if you don't want a built bar, the protein bar, which is covered in chocolate, it's the best tasting protein bar on the market. You can try built puffs, which is a protein infused marshmallow. Uh, I, all kinds of NFTs, protein infused marshmallows. It's a brave new world, people. I am just trying to navigate this as an old person. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're like a treat. These things can be used as snacks, treats. You can eliminate chocolate bars from your your, your diet and put these in and you know that you're getting something healthy. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15. It's gonna get you 15% off every single time so sample one you don't have to stock up don't feel pressure to buy a ton of things just go check it out scroll over each one it'll show you the nutrition information so they're not hiding anything use promo code lock 15 you get 15 percent off every single time at built.com tom i don't know if you've noticed but uh paint pictures on the heater uh, like you read about oh man i that, that's such a good feeling man i just when you're just when every time you shoot it you're just like yep that one's good oh dude. yeah like uh just man. no matter where you pull from you just you just know like uh yep i go oh you're giving me an inch of space see ya yep put the threes up oh man you start you start really talking like oh yeah like, like, like oh man like what my absolute favorite is like that's too much space that's too much like as you're shooting it just oh man my uh there there's two feelings that make me like absolutely just fill with joy on a floor one is when i set a pick 
and you just hear that little oof when the person doesn't realize it's coming that I'm like, Oh yeah. Caught you. <laughs> the second one is, and I, I go, I go that in that order, which is opposite of what your order would be because I'm, I'm generally down low, <laughs> but I'm sure you've experienced this when you catch the ball, when the ball swings over to you and, and the other team realizes that you've caught the ball and you've got time to shoot and you hear somebody go, Oh shit. <laughs> before you release the ball. I've had that happen a few times that like you catch it and you square up and you just hear somebody go, ah, oh, shit. That right there is the absolute like pinnacle on the floor. Cause it's like, yeah, you damn right. You're damn right. Um, also that ball better go in when they say that. Yeah. It's hundred percent. You know what else is a really good one though, is, is when, when you're, you're lining up your shot and somebody's like, who's got him. Yeah. Oh and yeah. Then, yeah. yeah. Um, so that one's really good. And then the, the it's the cousin of that one where somebody's like, you get out of the way. I'm going to guard this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Hanging points on his head. That's, oh, man. My, I, anyway, that, since since we're, since since we're right. describing this, I, I, I'll tell you my the, the one, the, fate, but the absolute best thing that's ever happened to me. <clears throat> we're playing in a tournament. I forget what school, somewhere in Maine, like my freshman or sophomore year in college. And the, the team, like Emerson historically had been just garbage garbage um and and they didn't like scout us or anything so the other team that we're facing had a big guy who was like nursing like a sore ankle and they sat him in in this game thinking like we're just gonna wipe through emerson and you know you just pick you we'll, we'll get you back so i demolish him in the first half like at halftime my coach was like what's the rebounding record in this building like just just torching him come out at halftime guess who's warming up they took they, they took him from resting they suited him up to come play me that's my absolute favorite moment that was i mean that gets no better than that it's it's better than the get out of the way i'll check him they took a dude who was in street clothes and they said you're getting dressed because we need you to guard this guy that was the best that's solid i talked solid. so much so much in that second half Oh my god! No, there's nothing, dude. There's nothing better than talking. Anyway, uh, Peyton Pritchard. Uh, yeah. Is, like, oh yeah, this is the, this is a Celtics podcast. This is Man, not I, the, uh... like, it's just you just feel so good for him because you know what that feeling is, and yeah, whew, he is he's feeling it. <laughs> so, um, I I wrote a piece on Boston Sports Journal, so I, I I picked up some of the numbers here, and and part of why. Pritchard has been like on such a heater. It's tied to the Jason Tatum conversation, which is kind of why I wanted to talk about it today. Yeah. It is tied to the Jason Tatum conversation because, and I think you tweeted out something a couple, a few days ago where Tatum was driving down the right side of the lane and three guys had converged on him. And, and there's Peyton Pritchard, like with his hands up, like, got it anytime now. And you're like, yeah, Peyton Pritchard's going to really like playing with Jason Tatum now. Uh, the, here's here are the wide open numbers via the NBA.com stats. Overall, 46 of 115, 40 percent. But about half of those makes have come since the All Star break. He's he's 22 of 43, which is 46 and a half percent since the All Star break. Then you go down to March. He's 16 of 33 in March. So of the 115 overall, more than a quarter of them have just come this month. Right. And he's 16 of 33 on those, so 48.5% on the wide open, no one within six feet of him. So he's shooting better, but he continues to get more and more wide open shots. And that's because Tatum and Jalen, those guys are, are drawing so much attention that they're just leaving anybody. And there's Peyton just getting – and, and um, the catch-and-shoot opportunities uh, are, are up too. And that, that just goes to show like since, since the all-star break, he's up to about four catch and shoot opportunities versus 1.7 before. So he's yeah. getting a lot more of the, it just shows you drive kick. He's there and he's just hitting it. And I do not know what your solution is there. Cause like you said, his, his shots are getting more and more open. Like this is th like, this is what having Jason Tatum now can do. This is why if he's not the MVP this year, take right. Take a good hard look at what he could become next year because like, like Peyton Pritchard is not going anywhere and the Celtics wisely. I don't mean to dump on Dennis Schroeder yet again, but like, <laughs> no, do it, do it. But like, look, 
even even without dumping on Dennis Schroeder, he just was objectively, obviously not the right fit. Peyton Pritchard can a hundred percent be the right fit because these are just target practice for him, and yeah. he's going to keep getting them and keep getting them and keep getting them. I mean, like you know, Grant Williams has improved drastically, and so much of that is due to his work, and a lot of it is due to the fact that he's just spotting up for target practice threes, like. Teams are freaking out about Jason Tatum, and they have to because he's still getting his buckets even while they freak out. But his passing has now improved to the point that people like Grant Williams, people like Peyton Pritchard are going to catch real heaters and really, and everybody's going to really help each other out. I don't know how many times I'm going to say symbiosis on this podcast. <laughs> Not insignificant. But the, the what ends up happening is this is this is all the precursor for the playoffs. This is the all right, we got to watch some film. We drew the Celtics in the first round. He, okay, here, okay, there's there's Tatum. They're doubling, they're blitzing him. Oh, okay, there's uh, Pritchard. He's wide open and he's hitting. We can't we can't leave him that open, all right? But what's your other option? Your other option is do you not double? How do you rotate? You, you got Grant Williams in one corner. This is, this is the bench unit now. This yeah. is in the bench units. You got Grant Williams in the corner, Peyton Pritchard, and Tatum, Derek White, and you know Rob, Rob, you know, yeah. you know. <laughs> so you've got a ball handler. You 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 can say, well, we're gonna leave. We're just gonna leave Derek. So okay, so you have Derek operate as far away as possible in the opposite corner, and it's fine. Um, he's still in. In if he starts, if he starts hitting, whoo, baby, watch out. Yeah. But there's there are no real solutions because. The hierarchy is you don't want to put people at the line. You don't want to give up the layups. You don't want to give up the threes. But if you're going to give up anything, you're going to give up threes to Peyton Pritchard and cross your fingers and say, let's hope he misses. I think ultimately a guy naturally, if he's, if he's covering Pritchard, he's just going to, he's going to hesitate a little bit. Because he's going to know this dude is 40-plus percent three-point shooter, and he's going to know that he'll pull, and he'll pull from 30, and he'll pull from, like, he, he, you still have to, like, respect that extra step. And, th and this is where Tatum's development really, really kicks in. That extra step that you get is all that Tatum needs because now he's getting by that first. You, that blitz, it's not happening right away. Now he's by that first. And then what happens? Then you've got who are you going to help off of there? Rob? Okay. Well, there's your alley oop. You're going to help off Grant in the corner, best three point shooter in the in the in the corner of this in the NBA. Like th there are very few options, but at some point that natural tendency to be like, I can't leave this shooter. That's going to give Tatum and Jalen Brown too that extra lane. And if they get that extra six inches, that extra half second of a person hesitating to come over to double, that's the difference between getting to the rim and getting a layup, getting a three-point play, putting you in the penalty and putting up points versus getting that blitz and, and slowing the Celtics down and having them kick it out. Yeah. And look, all of those factors, um, the, the fact that all of those things are coming together the way they are is the Celtics, you know, their offense is fourth in the last two weeks. 125.8 points per 100 possessions. Like, like you, and we've, we've talked about their defense. Like we, we yep. like they're so their net rating over the last two weeks is just astronomical. Like, I mean, like, I don't know what the solution is. Like, I, I'm glad I'm not an NBA coach and that who has to deal with the Celtics. Cause I truly <laughs> don't know. Like, I don't know what you do about it. Um, you know, I, I, I will say, Richard is young still, at least in NBA terms, like at least in, at least in, uh, in years, uh, years played, um, you know, he is like, if, if he gets major playoff minutes, let's see how he shoots in those minutes, you know, playoff shooting is, is tougher. <laughs> like it, it's, yeah, we, we, I think we talked about it last time, right? Like play, the playoffs are for the big boys. Like this is where, you know, this is where you gotta, you gotta really step up. Um, so if, if Pritchard can do it there at that point, I don't know what you do to, to slow the Celtics down, but it is probably worth wondering just like, okay, if he's got a major role, like how is he going to shoot when it, when it really matters, like it does in the playoffs, that that's probably worth considering. 
It, it really now now the other side of it though is and he mentioned it at practice on on Thursday is the defense. Yeah. And so he's 62 and he he's tenacious. Yeah. Um we've talked about this. They say like Scal says, "Hey, look, if you if you are being defended by Peyton Pritchard, you're going to bite marks on your ankles." Well, <laughs> that because that's where that's where his face is, basically around your ankles. You know, like that's he can't if you're going to switch, you can't switch him onto a whole lot of people like in a first round matchup if he's in there and demar derozan's in there derozan's just gonna shoot over the top of him you you, you sure. have to be aware of that now he did have that derozan really, has tough ankles he's very tough ankles like really um although i would say no playoff history to speak of True. but tough ankles um the that that play with jordan clarkson where Pritchard just defends the hell out of him and Marcus Smart ch chest bumps him. That, that was an amazing sequence and an amazing play. And it, that was great. Um, but I still, I no offense to Peyton, but like you're still, Eme talks about we don't have any weak spots defensively with the starting lineup or whatever, whatever closing lineup you throw out there. So where in this does Pritchard fit? Is he just like a second quarter? kind of third quarter, like, okay, that guy sat down for two minutes. Let's get Pritchard in there. And, or, or like, I'm afraid that we're, you know, we're, we're gassing him up and all of that stuff, which is very warranted, but we're looking at like playoff DNPs. I don't think we're going to see playoff DNPs. Cause I think he's shooting so well that like, cause I mean, three points is still a lot of points and like, you start stringing a couple two. of threes together. You space the floor. Like, you know, you've got all this, you know, like if, if you space the floor, get Tatum, you know, some, just a little bit of extra room. I think all of that stuff is going to be valuable enough to get in the game. Now, you know, it, it like you said, is it going to be matchup dependent? Is it going to be when, um, you know, you're, you're, the opposing guard goes to the bench? Look, I, I don't think that's out of the question. But, I mean, you know, the Celtics have, have sort of acknowledged that their defense does kind of follow their offense sometimes and, you know, and, and vice versa, certainly. But like, you know, like at, at times, yeah, you play better defense if your offense is clicking. If if Pritchard helps your offense click, maybe you can kind of make things work on the other end for, you know, for a little while, even if you don't have necessarily the ideal matchup out there. But so, I mean, I don't think it's DMPs. I do think it's worth wondering. Yeah. I mean, is it going to be 10 minutes? Is it going to be 12 minutes? If, he, if it is only that many minutes, is that going to be enough for him to kind of feel good and, and keep making yeah. the shots at the same rate that he has been? Very, all valid questions. But um, I, I do think that, like, the ability to make threes and space the floor, especially on this team, um, and the value that that provides for everybody else, especially Tatum and Brown on the offensive end, is probably going to keep him at least getting some minutes in the postseason. I, I, will, I will just – I'll end with this. Playoffs are – are yes, they're for the big boys. It's about confidence. Yeah. And confidence is built now. Confidence is built at this point. And you walk into a playoff series. If the Celtics walk into a playoff series against anybody, Chicago, Brooklyn, Philly, you walk in with your chest puffed out and you feel like, yeah, let's go. Bring it on, whatever you got. And and Pritchard's like, don't let me catch it. Don't let me catch it. If he's got that, just don't give me it, don't give me that space. Then, then he'll find a way. He'll yep. get hot quick. Um, knowing now, as we head into the last eight games of the regular season, knowing Jason Tatum, trust me, Jalen Brown, trust me. I'm in. I'm hitting at this clip where people are writing about me. Like this is this is the high note. This is how you want to go into the playoffs. And and the one other thing that I'll add is. Ime will will give him, give it to him straight. This is what your role is going to be. This is what you should prepare for. It's going to be probably this many minutes, and it'll be more if something changes, but this is what you prepare for. Get your mind around that and be ready for it. And I I, I do trust that. I do trust that. I trust the confidence, and hopefully that that's enough to, to carry that through. Yep. I would agree with all of that. All right, then. Wow. I love ending a podcast on I agree with everything you just said. So we will do that. Tom Westerholm, Boston.com, Tom underscore NBA on Twitter. Uh, appreciate you, Tom. Appreciate and you. I appreciate everybody who just listened to that 
extensive podcast. I like going long on Fridays. I don't know. Just you, if you finish half of it on your way to work or wherever you finish the other half on Saturday, you know, it's do you chilling, chilling out, listen to half on, on the podcast, watch the other half on YouTube because the show's everywhere. So do that. Uh, subscribe wherever you can subscribe. This show is free everywhere. Podcasts exist. YouTube, we're crossing, we're getting close to 4,600 subscribers on YouTube. So let's want to get that to five 5,000 by the end of the regular season. So you might need your help if you share the podcast, spread the word, tell everybody to be listening to and watching the Locked On Selfish Podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network.